don't know if it's going to be recorded because it's a lot of the session. I asked it to be the case. So where's the microphone? Uh, so first of all, like congratulations for yesterday. Uh, you had you did a great job actually. Uh, they were very excited. Everybody, like everybody that came, like researchers and uh, people from the industry, uh, they were quite impressed by the quality of the posters. Um, some even told me that they have to get better prepared for their presentation because uh, <laughs> you're, you raise the bar too high. Uh, so yeah, be proud. I hope you also enjoyed it. Uh, so welcome to the last lecture of the course. Uh, so for the last lecture, uh, we're going to discuss about deep uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, I'm sure that many of you already know quite a few things about it, given that you've already uh, presented posters. Um, but uh, in any case, it's a very interesting topic, one of the most uh, well popular ones, uh, and uh, well, one that definitely attracts the attention of uh, a lot of people around the world. Google DeepMind was uh, uh, built on the very premises of uh, deep reinforcement learning. <coughs> Oh, by the way, we're having also a, a background recording. Uh, that's for uh, like my evaluation whether I'm a good teacher or not. Uh, and you're going to be recorded, so if you have a problem with that, well, I guess you can, I don't know, wear a big jacket <laughs> so you're not visible. <laughs> if it's the last lecture, do you also have some sort of evaluation for me? Yes, we're going to have some. Wait, uh, we're going to have a form for the background. But I'm uh, also going to give you evaluation forms for the uh, course in the exam. It to be during the exam. Yeah, during the exam. <coughs> uh, all right. Uh, all right. So. <coughs> Let's start. Uh, reinforcement learning, as we saw yesterday from some of the pitches, uh, refers to the um, uh, uh, case where uh, you're having, for instance, a Atari game, um, and then you want to learn a model that can actually play the Atari game by itself without uh, explicitly uh, constructing it how to do it. Uh, so, uh, uh, what is reinforcement learning? Before going uh, to deep reinforcement learning, uh, a few, like I heard, a small recap. Uh, it's a general purpose framework uh, for learning artificial intelligence models. Uh, and uh, in reinforcement learning, you assume that the agent can take actions. Uh, it can act. Now, perhaps you can already say that something like that uh, uh, happens uh, uh, with supervised classification. You can say that taking a prediction is a, an action, so to speak. But uh, a crucial difference here is that uh, uh, here in reinforced learning, these actions affect the so-called environment where the agents operate. So there is uh, a, a somewhat specific state of, of the environment and the state of the agent. What does this mean? It means that given uh, uh, the state of the environment, so what's going on uh, uh, in the world, so to speak, um, the agent can take an action. And uh, based on the action, there will be a reaction from the environment, uh, quantitatively measured by a reward. Now, the reward can be positive or negative. Um, for instance, if I go to a bar and then I punch somebody, I'm going to have a negative reward because probably I'm going to be given up. Uh, <laughs> so that's a bad action, a negative reward, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So the goal. Of our, our, our agents to learn how to take actions that maximize future rewards. So how to make uh, how to make sure that I win the game that I'm in. Uh, it's a very competitive world here. So yeah. So can you give me some examples of RL? Yeah. Mostly playing games like Go <laughs> Okay, well, yes, that's definitely one. Yeah. I guess you can also do for like self-driving cars. Self-driving cars? Correct, actually, yes, you can definitely pose it as, uh, can 
explain why you stopped driving cars in Nara? Uh, like the same, you have to take an action which is driving or steering. So right. It affects your environment because you can be in another place. Right, right. Of course, what would be the reward there? Uh, that's a good question. Like uh, getting closer to your and not running over pedestrians. The only negative reward to do that. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. We can also try to model a human or a robot and try to see how we could learn to walk. Right. So like a physics uh, type of um, uh, simulation, right? Other In cases? Board game. Board game. Okay, board game falls in the same category of games, but yes, correct. Bots uh, in gaming, for example, StarCraft. You really love gaming. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but uh, some other cases? Yes? Education in general? Education in general. Can you be a bit more? Well, you get a reward even after this course, supposedly. Yeah, okay, but that's RL for students, not for <laughs> <laughs> machine learning model. Medicine, maybe? If you give someone the action, would be giving a certain type of medicine, and the reward would be <laughs> we don't really, it's a list. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, what, what, what would be the difficulty in this? I, I agree, that's my What would be the difficulty there? The ethics, but also... Not the ethics, ah, okay, the ethics is definitely difficult, but it's more important. <laughs> it's hard to measure, probably, because you don't really know, if the, if the patient has to scale itself right. or getting better. One of the problems there is that you have to have a very good simulation model for the, your environment, right? And perhaps our understanding of the uh, like human anatomy or physiology is uh, hard. But definitely, yeah, that's uh, one case where we can uh, apply RL. Yeah. And then they also use it for machine translation, sample generation. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So that's a very nice uh, uh, also example because you can um, phrase or um, reformulate existing uh, machine learning models uh, from a supervised classification point of view to uh, also to an RL point of view. Now, it's not going to necessarily work, going to work better, uh, not always, especially if you have explicit um, labeling, then I don't think it's going to give much, much better results. But you can definitely do that, especially if you want to go to one supervised case. We're going to see actually um, uh, how that is possible afterwards. Yeah? Stop my vision. Very good. That's also a very good. Uh, that's a great example, actually, because uh, stock markets are a live ecosystem, which is like digitally, in a way, um, or formulated, so uh, you can definitely build an agent there. Uh, you buy it if you have enough money. <laughs> but there are good simulators there also. So uh, actually, you, you you got I think uh, all of them or most of them. Um, so uh, controlling physical systems, that's definitely a case, a use case uh, for RL. Uh, so I wrote the walking, jumping, driving. Now for for those that you don't know. Uh, uh, there is the OpenAI gym. OpenAI is a, a big company from Elon Musk. And um, uh, they're also interested in, in reinforcement learning. So um, they created this uh, standardized benchmark of, or platform where you can, can try your own uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. It's called OpenAI gym. And then you've got like a, a robot trying to do various tasks like uh, jumping or uh, running or uh, I don't know the English name for it. Uh, yeah, robot skipping. Uh, but uh, yeah, logistics, so scheduling, bandwidth or allocation, if you have a big factory and then uh, you want to learn how to take the optimal, like how to move boxes optimally and stuff, uh, RL is a great um, uh, great framework to, to, to implement that. Games, as you, like a lot of people said, <laughs> uh, Atari, Go, Chess, Pac-Man, board games. Uh, and learning sequential algorithms, that's another interesting uh, uh, area. Um, RL then becomes more of a, a tool, how to do that, because RL, as we see, is, uh, uh, enables uh, training uh, model without having explic explicitly uh, differentiable objectives. <coughs> so um, an abstraction of reinforcement learning uh, is as follows. Um, you have that's like in a way the the pipeline. It's circular because you take actions and these actions uh, return rewards, etc., etc. Make it work at all? Uh, so um, 
You start with your learning agent here. That's your model, your little model. And in the beginning, it doesn't know anything, but it can take actions. It can walk, it can like uh, kick the ball or whatever. The state is the state of the environment. So for all, like, uh, uh, for all uh, purposes, like that's uh, what uh, the agent perceives of the world around it. It's a perception of uh, the agent about the environment. Now, uh, uh, the state might be uh, partially visible or fully visible. That depends on, of course, your assumption and on uh, um, uh, on the real on your reality. So a robot that uh, navigates through a labyrinth cannot have, um, in practice, um, knowledge about what uh, happens to the rest of the labyrinth before exploring. So that's like a partially observable environment. But there are other cases where we have uh, full observational capabilities. Everywhere. That's a fully observable case. Uh, the robot can take actions, like kicking the ball, or walking, or not doing anything. Um, do you believe that actions um, can be uh, like enumerated or not enumerated? Are they finite or infinite? Or that depends. That's an environment working on. Alright. You're keeping a whole uh, continuous set of possible directions, probably that's like an infinite set of actions. Exactly. So actions uh, can be, uh, there's a lar large variety of actions you can take. Like uh, even when you're kicking the ball, the strength with which you're going to kick the ball is itself an action. It's a decision that the agent has to take. So uh, of course, that depends how complex, depends on how complex your model is. But uh, in principle, you can make it very, very complex if uh, you consider having a very simple palette of actions. And we have the dynamical system in the world uh, which is going to return a reward. So uh, our uh, our model, the learning engine, is going to do an action which is going to affect the dynamical system, the world. So it raises uh, the robot uh, score a goal. If it scored a goal, it's going to return a, a good reward, like plus one. If it missed, it's going to take a negative reward, minus one. Uh, and then based on, uh, of course, the action uh, that uh, the robot took, the, the world changed. So for instance, in the case of the goal, you have to, like, uh, first of all, the score changes, and then also you have to take the ball and put it in the uh, center to start again. So the state, state gets updated. Now, uh, the reward, um, what do you believe about the reward, the nature of the reward is? Is it like immediate? Is it like a later reward? Is it, uh, what can be a reward for a software? Okay, that's definitely one reward. That's actually a midterm reward, right? That's not right. So that's a, definitely the the best reward. Standing on your own feet, that's also a reward again. <laughs> In case of a robot. Getting the ball to the other side. So yes. Yeah. Right. So all all these are essentially assumptions that uh, or. Yeah, they're, they're in a way modeling assumptions that were created. Uh, of course, the, in the best case, you want the rewards to be as simple as possible because you don't want to um, bias your model. The more assumptions you're, you're creating, you're biasing your model. The best is to just say, like as a human, how do you define a good footballer, be it a robot or not? Well, if uh, this robot can win games, uh, that's a good uh, footballer, football player. Accelerate the rate of learning. 
so it's very practical. Perhaps you can do like some pre-training to make sure that the robot can first walk before playing football. Because if you wouldn't say that you could technically also just crawl and kick the ball with the head. Right. That's not his arms. Okay. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that uh, in general, uh, uh, in deep reinforcement learning, as we'll see later on, people try to have the minimal, the minimal sets of assumptions, the minimal set of rewards. And then based on that, the algorithm, the model, our robot has to learn how to do things optimally by itself. We shouldn't bias it. But that said, in practice, you don't want to always build like a successful robot uh, football player. You want to just uh, do the job. And then in that case, have, of course, extra assumptions um, and help. Uh, but don't forget that the more assumptions you create, the more uh, bias you introduce to the system. So always be aware of your own, like make a distinction between what uh, uh, explicitly you add to the model and what not. There was another. Yeah, that was my point. I think the more the science around the reward, the faster you will convert it, and then you're less generous. Exactly. Exactly. It's about generalization versus <coughs> specification. Uh, there is nothing but. If you write a paper and then say, okay, I, I could also uh, uh, so you're on a robotics conference, and then you say, okay, I use rewards to uh, for the robot to also be able to walk, then they're going to be fine with it. If you're uh, writing a paper for a, a reinforcement learning uh, conference, and then uh, you say that, they're not going to be fine. Because they say, okay, you introduce assumptions, and then what's not? So it all depends on the context of the application. <coughs> uh, so how do we decide then? Like, uh, okay, in this block diagram, we had a block diagram. Yes. Um, what's the difference to a genetic algorithm? Well, genetic algorithm is not uh, about taking action, right? Well, you're taking an action, and then you have a fit assumption to score the different models, which I think is the same as a food quote here. I think genetic algorithms is a way of training, right? Like we have to do permutations and then uh, mixing and stuff. So uh, uh, I think there is definitely similarity, and probably you can use a genetic like algorithm to train your post learning system. But uh, the reinforcement learning system is uh, is a framework in general. It's not an, it's not an algorithm. The end algorithms are algorithms. So actually, as we will see later on, a reinforcement learning sits between unsupervised learning and supervised learning. In supervised learning, you have labels. So in a way, our, the labels that you have, you can see them as uh, rewards. If you have the correct prediction, uh, then this gives you a good reward. If you have the wrong prediction, this gives you a bad reward, a negative reward. Um, now, the problem, of course, in the supervised case is that you already have the labels, so you can apply standard uh, algorithms, like supervised learning algorithms, and you can avoid the whole uh, um, the remaining the framework in RL, uh, which makes it more complicated. But RL is able to also uh, solve in a way or to be trained for supervised uh, learning algorithms. Unsupervised is the opposite, or the other extreme, where you have no knowledge about the environment, and you're also having no way to get any feedback from it. I see you're not very convinced, but maybe we can discuss that. <laughs> okay, otherwise, it's going to take a while. Um, so, uh, how do we decide about our actions and snakes and rewards? Like, well, we have like a block diagram here with blobs and everything, so every block becomes a function. Uh, so we have a policy function, which selects an action given a current state. Uh, we have a value function, which uh, is the expected total reward that we'll receive when we take an action. So that's like, uh, I think of it also as humans, like uh, policy is like uh, when you're deciding uh, what to do, and uh, value is a function is, uh, uh, to predict how good this action will be for you. Uh, and uh, well, what should our goal uh, uh, then be? Uh, uh, for, for our value function, our goal is, uh, or let's say we can uh, reformulate 
the value function as the uh, expectation of the total sum of rewards. So R here is a reward at the next time. So in the case of the robot, we take one action which gives a reward. Now, uh, for the immediate, immediately next step, we'll have a new reward, RT plus one. But uh, if we imagine that we can uh, continue like that with the same algorithm, let's say that the algorithm has converged, uh, we can perhaps imagine all the possible futures, right? And then we can take uh, the sum of all possible future rewards. Is that clear? So what does gamma here stand for? <coughs> if you know about it, don't say. <laughs> Is there somebody who doesn't? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> yes. How important is that future? Exactly. So gamma is a value between 0 and 1, which tells you how much you should uh, uh, emphasize or trust your future rewards. So if, uh, like let's say, in, 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 let's say we have the case of like uh, having the perfect human, the perfect person, and then uh, the ultimate reward is like, I don't know, to be, okay, that's a hard, <laughs> <laughs> hard example. Uh, well, anyways, let's say that the, the goal, the perfect goal is to be able to live to 100 years old. <laughs> Now, that's a very long reward, right? <laughs> you have to wait 100 years before it gets there. So, um, and everything else becomes quite insignificant along the way. So, um, uh, with the gamma value, we decide how important is, uh, uh, how greedy we are, how important is uh, our next reward to be good, or how much we trust on the future. So, uh, the more we trust in the future, the larger gamma should be. And then we learn to take uh, uh, actions here. AT that maximizes this like function uh, for different states. Yeah? Would you base your gamma more on how deterministic your environment is? So if you know that if all my actions are going to have the, the outcomes I expect, then I can put gamma on the way one because I know that yeah, the outcome will be the one I plan. But if it's not deterministic, then you know, there is more and more uncertainty the further I look in the future. And then probably you, you want to regarding less than, than short history. I think that uh, uh, gamma is usually, uh, uh, it depends on the types of reward you have. If your rewards are very short term, mm -hmm. then gamma should be small, because uh, it's all about living the next day. <laughs> that would be, uh, but if, if, uh, uh, if you have like a, a longer term reward, like going to the university and just like having fun today, then gamma should be uh, higher. I don't know if it's like about having a deterministic environment because I don't think that really uh, matters. I mean, even if you have. No, I think how much you can trust your future rewards. And if there's more uncertainty, you can trust in that much and probably you want to wait on this. Right, but, okay, well, that makes sense. But then, if again, you've got a deterministic uh, 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 like environment, but all of your rewards are very short term, so like the counting, like uh, uh, doing successful operations, like mathematical operations, and as many as you do, the more points you get, then that's really short term, and then you just like that box. Right. <coughs> now, there are several approaches to uh, uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, each of them have their advantages and their disadvantages. So there is a policy-based uh, reinforced learning uh, approach where you're learning directly the optimal policy, I star. So you're learning the function which takes the best possible action given your existing like current state uh, to maximize your future reward. It doesn't mean that your future reward is going to be high because if you're in a bad place, you're in a bad place. But it's going to take the best possible action. Um, there is the, the value-based uh, uh, approach uh, for reinforcement learning, uh, where you're learning the optimal value function 
irrespective of uh, the pulse function. Meaning that you can apply any pulse function, any type of uh, model, it doesn't matter. As long as you can compute the value function, uh, that's all right. That's a, a, a bit more like a, a broader and abstract way of uh, learning. Uh, and there's also model-based uh, reinforcement learning where you have to build a model for the environment. And uh, then you have to plan on the site uh, using that model. Can you uh, tell me about the model-based case? What are advantages and disadvantages? Be brave. <laughs> if you have a really big environment, it would be hard to do. I mean, for an Atari screen, it's not that big of an environment, but for the world, whatever. Yes. It's just too big. Right. So the more complex your environment is, the harder it is to make a good simulator, right? <coughs> and I suppose having a bad simulator is even worse, yeah. right? It also has a lot of uh, assumptions about your environment. Exactly. It's not more time to create. So we need like a lot of knowledge of our environment uh, to be able to do that, right? So especially if you're in a real world situation and not in a, in a, in a fictitious uh, uh, framework like playing games, then it's not going to be super good unless you've got very good understanding. So maybe for simulations of like physics simulations, that works. But for everything else, <coughs> other advantages or disadvantages? Yes? No, you cannot make it generic. Precisely. That's a very strong piece of advantage, right? If I build the perfect uh, model for my environment for playing soccer, I cannot take it, the algorithm or the result and then <coughs> use it for basketball. Or at least it's not very straightforward. You cannot know if it's going to work the same as well. <coughs> Value-based learning, does that mean to make a value or to optimize the value functions so that it will alloc allocate the largest value to states that would have the highest reward? Yes. So uh, now that's the uh, uh, famous Bellman equation. How many of you have heard of the Bellman equation? So uh, for those that haven't heard of the Bellman equation, uh, how can we rewrite this uh, function more compactly? It's morning, I understand. <laughs> right. So there is a recurrence to that, right? So in fact, that's uh, you do it. So you're taking the expectation because you can rewrite. Every, so uh, because you've got summation, the expectation can go like uh, inside the summation, and you can swap. So everything in the future can be already uh, 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 taken into account from now. Of course, we cannot know all the possible futures, but we can rewrite it compactly. So here, yes, prime is about all the possible new actions. And then if you expand it, then you're going to have exactly the same formula. If you expand, uh, because the QP here inside, it is, uh, has exactly the same form outside. Is that clear? Yes. So S prime includes the summation? Sorry? S prime uh, includes the summation? No, no, the Q. So here, you have, so above in the bottom line, you've got summation. <coughs> And uh, here uh, you've got like the, the next word R plus the function itself. So the function itself contains again an R and the function itself. And then again an R and the function itself. So if you actually expand it infinitely, you can have essentially the same form. Okay. So that's the Bellman equation. Yeah. Uh, should it be the expected value uh, by S given S T A T? S prime given S T A T? Uh, because I already acted. So I reduce the number of possible states in which I find myself, and the distribution is going to be different. Uh, no, no, the S and uh, the expectation taken for, for S prime, because that's what is actually in the uh, Q. 
What's in the form? Oh, okay, so the, it should be uh, okay, it's different. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, similarly, we can rewrite then the optimal value function because that's what we want to have in the end. Uh, our um, yeah, our our final goal is actually not to have uh, our final goal is not to just have the uh, uh, the value function in general. In the beginning, value function always returns random results. We want to have a way to efficiently compute the optimal value function, so we can rewrite it uh, similarly as uh, the expectation of the R uh, plus uh, the discounted with gamma. A maximum value function for the next step. Why do we take the maximum? Best the maximum stands for the best action. So the action that will return the best future value function, value for our value function. All right, is it here? <coughs> <clears throat> so in the simplest case, the, uh, the value function can be a table. So if you have like a set of states, like in a tic-tac-toe type of uh, game, you can actually enumerate all the states, right? And then you can also enumerate all the actions, nine positions. <coughs> uh, and in the beginning of the learning, the function, the table, will be wrong because we have no idea. That's the idea of the reinforced learning, right? You have to learn by yourself. So in the beginning, you uh, are going to have a very bad uh, policy function and a very bad value function. But to the limit, using value iteration algorithms, uh, we can solve the Bellman equation. So it has been uh, proven that by iteratively, iteratively applying uh, uh, this uh, type of learning, uh, in the end, you will convert into the uh, optimal value function. It doesn't matter if in the beginning you're taking random uh, actions or you have random values. That's all right. As long as you're sticking to the uh, plan, then you're going to have an optimal uh, RL agent. All um, <clears throat> Now, of course, computing the Q value is often expensive, right? Why is it expensive? So when is that expensive? There are too many obvious <laughs> Exactly. And in fact, you're not taking only uh, <coughs> expectation for all possible states, but also um, for all possible actions. So it's uh, quadratic in that sense. Uh, so that's especially hard when you have continuous uh, or high dimensional action spaces. Imagine you have a continuous alpha. How are you going to go there? In principle, you have to do it mathematically. You have to, uh, take the expectation of integ integration, and then you have to have uh, model functions that are uh, simple enough to be like, uh, uh, well, simplified. Uh, anyways, it becomes super complicated. Uh, so often defining the policy, instead of going for the value function, defining the policy uh, and trying to optimize things based on the policy function is an easier way. So in that case, we can use a nonlinear uh, function approximator to model uh, uh, the actual value function. So our deep network can be such a nonlinear function approximator, which optimizes or uh, implements our policy function, which given the state returns an action. Here, here I have a wrong notation, that's all. So that's the case of uh, policy optimization. We are putting a deep network or any other function. I mean, we don't have to make it uh, as complex as a deep network. It can be also a linear model. But anyways, we're optimizing for the policy function. Uh, let me see. Should we have a break now or? Let's have a break <coughs> now and then uh, we continue. Because that's a big uh, chapter. All right. Oh, the evaluation forms are here. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Let's start again. All right. Uh, so regarding the radio and the assignments, uh, 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 there are some mistakes here. There may be some uh, 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 complaints. Uh, right. Whenever you think it's like so there's a mistake somewhere or there is no enough justification, write us an email or send us a message to Piazza uh, to me and the TA. Uh, better private so that we don't uh, uh, mess or whatever if you wanna whatever. Like anyways, uh, write your case and then we're gonna go over. Uh, because uh, we've got many, we've got many students and <clears throat> individual assignments, of course, uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, get overlooked or also black for from my personal experience sometimes it doesn't work perfectly when you put in grades. It just uh, decides itself on the grades. Um, so uh, regarding the now uh, so okay we discussed about the reinforcement learning now we go to deep reinforcement learning. So how to make RL deep ideas? <laughs> yeah, having a neural net uh, predict the Q function. All right, that's one way. Uh, Other idea? It was in previous slide. <laughs> You can have a deep network uh, to implement the polis functionals, right? So not just predicting the Q value, so what's the next possible uh, uh, value, given, of course, actions and states, but predicting directly what is the best possible action that we can take. Uh, so in a way, these two are expressed in these two uh, block diagrams. So in the next, uh, in the first, uh, to the left, we have exactly what uh, you suggested. So you, you've got a state, you've got a possible action, and we have to break the Q value. Uh, and the, the deep network is supposed to do this mapping, this uh, prediction. Uh, but uh, you can also uh, have uh, as input the state of the environment, uh, pass it through the network, and then predict different Q values, uh, given actions, different actions that you're going to what is the difference between the two? What is that one that's, for instance, on the one to the right? Here in those options? Oh, no, I mean that one to the left. Yes, I meant one to the left, sorry. So to the right, what's the advanced one on to the right? So here you've got one to value per action, right? So the output is essentially the actions together with how good you're going to take the maximum of them, of them. So why would we implement our deep reinforcement learning framework as network to the right? More than zero. <laughs> no, that's not the good. It's not more, more natural. We have to define what natural is. But it runs only one time. You just see the state and the size. Precisely. That's a good question. So um, uh, here we have to actually enumerate the overall possible actions. When you have like a thousand different actions, essentially you're going to have 1,000 forward passes just for one state. Whereas here, you just have the state, you propagate, and then you got uh, directly with one forward propagation, you got uh, all, uh, all your answers for all your 1,000 actions. So much, much faster. <coughs> uh, so with deep reinforcement learning, again, we're taking, we're making actions uh, time according to a policy function. And again, we're uh, optimizing uh, the action value function with a discount uh, factor. And we're using only a function approximator uh, for, for this value per action. So essentially, in our block diagram from before, we're going to have a deep neural network here. Uh, um, Simulating our learning agent, which takes the optimal uh, actions given uh, the state, and of course uh, uh, the rewards it receives. Uh, so uh, training the learning agent. Okay, 
I have to fix this. It's getting confusing. Um, so then we're training the neural network to return the, pos the best possible actions from uh, using the neural network as a policy. Uh, as a policy function, uh, and then the policy class can be either deterministic or stochastic. What does this mean? <coughs> stochastic explores new possibilities while deterministic just takes one action to do in a, every time you repeat the same state, that's the same action. Exactly. So uh, in your environment, then you've got a deterministic policy. It means that uh, if you have the same input, you're always going to have the same output. Uh, whereas stochastic means that you sample for it, you sample the match. So you're not taking the maximum of uh, uh, Q, Q value from all possible actions, but you're sampling it. Of course, uh, the maximum one will be sampled more frequently, but others are also uh, going to be picked more every now and then. So uh, in your opinion, um, during the training of the reinforcement learning agent, deep reinforcement learning agent, uh, in which, which part of the training do we want uh, the policy function to be deterministic or more deterministic, let's say, uh, and in which part of the training we want it to be more stochastic? At the beginning, you want to be more stochastic. Sorry? At the beginning, you want to be more stochastic. All right, why? Uh, because you want to try more options because you're less sure what's a good option. Right. And at the end, you want to be more to be a because you are more confident. Exactly. Giving the good action. Exactly. So we want to persist in the beginning because in the beginning we're not even sure what good and bad is. We, we have no knowledge. We're giving random outputs. So in the beginning, we want to be stochastic. We want to sample more. Uh, whereas later on, we can afford being more deterministic. Uh, so, uh, for deep reinforcement learning, um, again, as usual, the input should be as raw as possible. Uh, so, for, uh, for the case of like Atari games or computer vision, we've got the image frame, pixel wide. Uh, or maybe several frames. When do we need several frames? Mm. To get some sense of the velocity of things moving in your object. Uh, correct. Correct. Well, if you get if you get the sense of velocity, you need two frames. <coughs> when you need multiple frames. And I would say for planning, you need to know what you did before. Yes. Yes. Actually, there are all similar answers, right? Like with uh, with two, you get velocity. With more, you get acceleration and higher degrees of uh, like motion uh, change. But yeah, you definitely need it for planning because uh, you've got a better history of what. Um, your agent has been through. Uh, and uh, the output is the best possible action for maximizing the future reward. Important, uh, we don't need anymore to compute again. I'm going to emphasize that. The action value of the, act, uh, the, va the act actual value, I'm sure, the value of the action value function, uh, we just uh, get it uh, by having the maximum of all possibilities. Now, our objective is the following, it's less complicated uh, than it looks. So uh, we've got our parameters data. So these are the parameters of our network, our neural network which implements the policy function. Uh, and um, the target is uh, the red uh, um, font. So why is this a target? Normally, target is label, right? Like a human, human given supervised label. In our case, this is obviously not a label, it's something else. Why is it the target? Yes? It's the best action the agent can take. Exactly. So it's the best possible future action. Of course, we have a problem. We don't know what's the future action, right? It's like some sort of inception <laughs> type of uh, situation. But we're going to see how we can uh, resolve this one. So that's our target, and two uh, to the right is our uh, the action that we take. 
uh, and the two-lane gradient then becomes simply, uh, yeah, you just take the gradient up. So as simple as that. It's essentially a list squares on our future best possible options. Is that clear? I, I guess not. So what is not clear? Come on. First of all, we've got two values, right? Our two values are, what, what is the, the data type of our two values? Is it an integer, is it a floating number, what is it? Huh? Floating number. Floating number, so it's like a, a, that has decimal, right? Yeah. Right, so that's our, like, let's say, Q, right? And of course, the same goes for our Q prediction. <clears throat> now, let's say that we've got the optimal part of the value, we already know it. Some oracle has given it to us. All right? How are we going to train our network <coughs> to approximate the oracle two values? You've got like, uh, for instance, uh, hinge loss, list squares, uh, logistic or regression, etc., etc. Right? Which one are you going to select in this case? It's a decimal, it's a floating number, right? <coughs> it's regression, right? So you have to minimize the distance. Essentially, the one to the top right. Do you, do you agree? Okay. And here, now we're replacing our uh, oracle value. So we don't have an oracle. We only have our best possible uh, expectation of reward for the next round. So this equals. And what is the best possible? The red one, right? From from this. Right. That's the best possible. So we replace this here. So we're replacing the oracle now because we have no oracle in practice. It's reinforcement learning. So we have to start learning everything from scratch. We're replacing the oracle with our best possible prediction of an oracle, so to speak. And why is that going to work? It's kind of stupid, right? But why, why, why would that work? If you get the highest value for the most optimal future steps that can be taken after the current one. Exactly, and this means this is, has been proven to actually give the uh, Bellman equation optimum. So we know beforehand that if we do the iteration, even with wrong assumption, uh, wrong knowledge in the beginning, wrong parameters in the beginning, if we do it in the right way, of course, that's a, a bit theoretical, uh, it's a theorem, uh, I have to find the right parameters and do it in the correct way, but in principle, it tells you that you can do it. Yes. Contains inside himself. 
Yes, all the things are steps. Yes. So when we are doing the subtraction, actually, all the things that remains is R minus the next step, prediction. Yes. All the future steps are the same because we are predicting. Yeah, but we don't know them how to get without having taken them, right? So you know that you're 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 having an expectation of yeah. Actually, what you're saying is I think correct. I, I'm not sure I exactly understand your question. Maybe we can talk about it a bit later. Right? But uh, essentially, yes, you're making a prediction about what's going to be best next uh, in the next round. Uh, I don't see the addition of the future time step. I don't see how it happens. Oh, uh, okay. Then we're gonna come next. That's like that's like how you do it in practice, and we're gonna come next in that. Oh, uh, that's exactly the problem. It's like uh, 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 a forward loop, like it's a, um, a vicious circle. You cannot know that uh, since you all don't know what's the best. Yeah. I understand. So in practice, we're going to see how we can actually have it. And, uh, but you're correct in your, that's exactly um, the, the problem. <coughs> but uh, is the, 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 the objective function, is it here, Pedro? It's just least squares. It's like regression on our target values which are not optimal in the beginning but become optimal the more training we have it's like make believe in the beginning uh, we have to believe in ourselves and then hopefully we're gonna get better and better yeah okay, i have a question about the theta at the s, s prime a prime theta mm -hmm. as far as i know you have to get the parameters from the previous step yes and i don't understand why you get it from the previous step Next theta is from the current step. We're going to go over that in a while. All right? Ah, I'm happy. I'm a good question. Maybe I should put more reports to learn next time. <laughs> uh, so in practice, uh, you've got four steps. Uh, exactly because of the problem that were uh, mentioned beforehand. First, you have to do a feed forward pass for the current state. Uh, given the current state, uh, predict uh, the Q values for all possible actions. Right. So if I have like five actions, I'm gonna make get like uh, five uh, estimations of our Q values for the each of each of them. <coughs> so uh, then uh, we uh, do a fit for uh, task for the next state as prime, uh, and calculate the maximum over all uh, network outputs. So essentially, we're gonna Select the maximum now uh, action. We're going to use that one. And we're going to set the Q value target for action for this actor. Okay, I see that this is a bit complex, the way it's written. But uh, essentially, what we're going to do is we're uh, making a forward pass for all actions. We're uh, taking the one that looks the best, has the highest uh, value right now. Uh, and uh, uh, then we're going to set the target this to be the uh, value function the value for the value function for that particular action and then for all other actions we're going to keep the previous value let me First, you have the state S, which uh, gives you uh, values Q, given actions. <coughs> For uh, these actions, you have new states after each action, after you do them. So now, given the new state, you compute again the actions given the new state. So in a way, finding what is the best possible in the future, the best possible feature given our current knowledge, of course, of uh, the network. And now we're going back. And we're saying that we want the Q value in the first place to be equal to the future best, po best possible future. So we want to regress to the best possible future, of course, given our current understanding. 
while we're making, so that's for the best possible action. So we're taking the maximum in the second step, overall <coughs> network altitude. And for all the rest, we use the Q-value target from the beginning. So this. So for the maximum one, we use this uh, Q-value. And for everything else, we use the current value. Right? So if you call this, let's say, the target, it's going to have like QA, QA. It's going to be QA prime, QA. And this is going to be the best possible discovery in the intermediate step. Are you then going to compare all the possible actions uh, by, the by the objective function to this maximum value? Or just the one that is? There's, there was one action that did its maximum value, right? Yeah. So why wouldn't you just take that one instead of going through all these difficult things? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's how uh, you can do the part. But then why do we have an optimization function? Because we know that we just take the maximum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you have to take the future maximum. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so why do we uh, set the other uh, Q values for all other actions to zero? Sorry, to um, we set all the, the other uh, Q values, target Q values for all other non-optimal actions to the original Q value, so that we make the error zero. Why do we do that? <coughs> why you won't have zero error? Sorry? Then you only take into account the one that we want with the maximum. We have twisted those stays and you make the action. You don't? We have twisted the stays that you right. get when you make the action. No, the previous uh, answer was uh, more correct. You want? I want to sample. <laughs> uh, so you make the er if you make the error zero, it means that you have no back propagation. Right. Well, right. Or you have no update. So you cannot update based on uh, suboptimal actions. And then you update the weights using back propagation. Now that's the essence of uh, uh, learning for deep reinforcement learning. Uh, however, we have stability problems if we do it naively. And this relates to some other questions that we have for students. <laughs> for students. So naively Q learning oscillates or diverges with neural networks. Why could that be the case? No idea. Uh, all right. First of all, you've got sequential data. Right, you see like things happening in progression. Which means that you're breaking the IID assumption. You're not you don't have any more inputs and outputs that are independent and identically distributed. High pro highly correlated uh, samples, SGD is our best possible uh, method for uh, training a network. So these two contradict each other. Of course this is not uh, specific to RL, we've seen this earlier before, right? So uh, what is the solution? <coughs> so you have highly correlated samples. What do you do? You can skip some, yes, that's one good solution. Another? Shuffle. Shuffle. Perfect. So you have many batches where you shuffle stuff. We're going to see the solutions afterwards in more detail. Another one is your learning objective itself is a bit weird. Because your current prediction, your current target depends on, uh, on, on, on some future uh, which you don't have yet. So your future, no. The way you see the future depends on uh, your current neural network, your current understanding, your current parameters. However, once you back propagate and you update the parameters, the future is not relevant anymore because your understanding has changed. So you're essentially regressing on something 
which doesn't exist. It's up here. So the target depends on the Q function also. You've got like some sort of weird syndrome here. Uh, if we update the current Q function with backprop, the target will also change. This goes on top of the fact that your networks are highly non convex <coughs> Like if you change your parameter, you have like maybe very different landscapes. You can have weird minima or maxima. These two don't work well together. You're going to have problems with your learning. Uh, so uh, policy changes will change fast, even with slightly change the Q function, which means that you might have oscillations. Like for changing a bit the parameter, you might have completely weird uh, outputs. You're not going to have smoothness. And having smoothness is like the crux of learning. And you cannot have smoothness, that's very bad. Especially for uh, simple learning algorithms like SGD. Uh, also, the distribution of data might move from one uh, extreme to the other for the same reason. You're having too many changes. You're depending too much uh, on, on your previous self, which is not good for your network. Your networks are a special case because they are highly non convex. If you have a linear function, perhaps you would have uh, a better behavior. You have stupider decisions, but more consistent. <coughs> At least you can converge. <coughs> Another problem is that you cannot control easily the scale of the two values. Because it's sort of a regression problem. At least this is how it's cast right uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, you cannot say that the Q value will be necessarily getting very specific values. We don't know actually what these values are. That's what you're trying to learn. So the gradients can be unstable, and uh, uh, there is no guarantee that we will have a particular range of Q values. Where else have we observed similar behavior? <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> so with recurrent network, we had a similar problem, right? You had gradients that were either too large or too small, and they were generally unstable. So they were making uh, learning hard. Um, so now some fixes, some pro uh, ways to improve uh, them learning. So these were the problems. Some ways now to fix the problems is uh, the first one is experience replay. The experience replay was introduced by, I think, the Tariq paper, uh, or anyways, uh, a few years back. Uh, it's also called uh, replay memory. And then the idea is that you're going to store the memories, like S, A, R. So, no, sorry, you're going to store the tuples, S for state, R state, action, for A for action, R for the reward, and S prime for the future state, based on the action that you took. And then you're going to train using randomly stored, right, you're going to, yeah, randomly stored uh, memories instead of having the live memory. So you're playing the game. I'm playing Pac-Man. But I'm not going to use my uh, current, current uh, uh, last input out of rewards to update my function. I'm going to use instead uh, my stored experience replay memories uh, to sample random from them and then back propagate. And of course, now the important thing is how to uh, sample, what to sample, how to store, uh, etc., etc. Now this, what, what this, uh, what this uh, uh, solution uh, fixes? It fixes the IID assumption. Now you don't have in your mini batch tuples that are all highly correlated. One might come from 10 seconds away, another one from 2 seconds away, etc., etc. Is it here? Oh. Yeah. But then how do you, like, you, when you just play the game to get some uh, states and uh, some information, it means that you, you can't learn at the same time? Because you, when you start, you have no memory. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's like the initializations. And then perhaps you can play for, in the beginning, for Q uh, uh, states, perhaps uh, skipping uh, states to uh, avoid having correlation. And then uh, you have to grow, of course, uh, your memory, your experience playing memory before you start applying it. Yeah. Okay, so instead of learning over time, you learn every x time step you choose to take memories. 
Uh, you don't, uh, have, I don't think you've got the scheduling system. You don't say I'm learning every k steps. You're uh, learning by random shuffling. So in the, in, actually you might uh, 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 keep very old memories and that's a way to also not forget. So there is no, you're, you're not saying I'm gonna, at least in the papers that have been published uh, and to my best of my, the, no, the best of my knowledge, I, I, I haven't seen people saying I'm gonna pick one from like 10 seconds, one from five seconds, and one from two seconds. They're just randomly something. And by the way, you're constructing your experience replay uh, data set, let's call it like that. Um, you will have, of course, uh, more experiences from the way back, and the, sorry, less experiences from way back, and more experiences from like the recent past. But you don't do it explicitly. All right. So like that, you break the temporal dependencies, and you learn from all past policies. <clears throat> so uh, the way it works is that you take an action according to an epsilon greedy policy. Uh, we're going to see what epsilon greedy policy is uh, in a while. We sort the transition, the tuple. Then we sample a random mini batch of transitions, and we optimize uh, mean squared error using the mini batch. And of course, it's important, of course, to update your data set of experiences because in the beginning, especially, they're not good. Uh, right, so um, maybe here is interesting to say that um, uh, in the reinforcement learning framework, it's a battle between learning, having a network that can predict good, can learn to predict something useful, but also something relevant. Right, so if, uh, uh, you want your network to make reasonable predictions anyways, because in the beginning it's going to be giving random predictions, but you also want to explore possibilities. You don't want to. <coughs> Uh, forget it because uh, uh, your 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 environment might be very large. You don't know if you have uh, explored all, all possible possibilities. <coughs> now another uh, uh, fix is to freeze uh, the target network, and that's a solution to the problem of having oscillations because your future target depends on your current network. So the way you fix that is you're saying I'm going to have two networks, uh, one to learning uh, and one to target. And then the Q target is essentially uh, similar to the Q learning from the past. So you're freezing, you're taking the Q learning uh, uh, from this current type time step, you copy its parameters to the Q target, and then you keep the Q target fixed for, for a while. You keep updating the Q learning, but the target uh, values are uh, uh, taken from the Q <coughs> um, And then again, you optimize the same objective function like before. And we did where we this oscillation. Is, that, is this clear? But how do you then update? Is it then only within every. Yes. So many iterations? Exactly. So every k iterations, you update your uh, Q target. Essentially, meaning you're copying the current Q learning parameters to it. Mm -hmm. If you learning gets updated uh, every time. Alright? Yes? So after the iterations, when we have when we have trained the target Q network, mm -hmm. do we simply copy uh, its parameters to the original one or do we copy like an alpha parameter? Well, that depends it? like on the the pros. Like, uh, it's, it's very important to understand that these are like, uh, this area is still in flux, right? So uh, there are many ways you can do it. Uh, from what I've read so far, I think it's true, you just copy. But uh, maybe taking a, like, a, a weighted summation of parameters when could make sense. I don't know, it depends on your hyperparameters, how frequently you do that. And the third fix uh, is to click uh, uh, the rewards to be in a particular range. Uh, so uh, you make sure that uh, your network is not going to give you crazy values. Or you can also normalize them to, to, to be in a certain range. The negative, uh, the, the disadvantage here, however, is that um, maybe it's uh, less easy to say the difference between large and small rewards. Can you give me an example of this? What does this mean? So 
So if you take a really, if, if plus one is winning, mm -hmm. you're taking a step is a minus. So one to the power of minus four, ten to the power of, you know, right. that you don't really learn. Yeah, so exactly. So the thing is, uh, uh, let's say in the case of Pac-Man, you get plus one reward if you're making one of the like yellow dots. Uh, but then, ideally, you would have to have very high reward if you win the game, right? So if you win, if you win, if you eat monsters, you, you get plus ten, and if you win the game, you get plus hundred. So something exponential. Winning the game is not uh, twice as important as hitting a yellow dot. So you cannot make it two. You have to make it quite large, so that the agent learns what is important and what is not. But now if you scale uh, one hundred, so from plus one to hundred, to the minus one uh, to one range. Uh, the values uh, decrease exponentially, which is a very big problem, especially with uh, least squares uh, loss function. With least squares, you're magnifying uh, uh, wrongly uh, your mistakes in case of very small numbers, or you don't take them into account. It depends on the distributions. <coughs> now, as a result, uh, some results for these three fixes. Uh, from the Atari Painter. <coughs> now that's the standard key learning. These values are the rewards, average rewards, like feature reward. And uh, we see that uh, uh, by having uh, progressively adding more and more fixes, we get uh, better and better results. In some cases, considerably better. So compared to the key learning in the beginning, which is three, uh, having all three uh, leads to I don't know, two orders of magnitude higher uh, rewards. So these three problems are very important. Now that's like, there was a, red, a question before. Uh, what does it mean when like, coming about training? Here the network is exactly the same. The objectives, the objective functions are exactly the same, so to speak, at least mathematically. However, the way that you train these functions is crucial. It can be as crucial as two orders of uh, magnitude uh, better performance. Some extra tricks. Skipping frames helps for uh, removing or uh, ensuring IID, the IID assumption holds, and also saves time in computation. Well, anyways, in many cases, in many games, the different one from the other is uh, minimal. Uh, it, epsilon greedy behavioral policy is also quite uh, important with uh, an ill temperature during <coughs> training. So you're saying at the beginning, I'm going to take, so epsilon greedy policy means. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, take an action according to uh, uh, what my network says, but only with a certain probability. So uh, if I say that if I say that uh, I use a probability p 0.9, it means that um, I'm going to select uh, my uh, uh, random action, randomly sampled action with a probability uh, 0.9, or the one that my uh, model uh, chooses by probability 0.1. And usually you have this probability to be annealed. It means that uh, you're having here temperature. And then the more training, the less random the epsilon gradient should become. In the beginning, we want to be stochastic, as stochastic as possible. We want to explore options. We don't trust our network. We want random things. The rewards, remember, rewards are actually correct. The rewards are the ones that your network, uh, sorry, your environment gives. It's your network you don't trust. So in the beginning, uh, doing random stuff is all right. Because you trust the environment and you trust the rewards. But later on, you should uh, have more and more faith in your network, in your model. Yes? How can you skip frames? Because isn't the next frame dependent on what we did before? So if we skip a frame, how do we know what the state of the environment is? Yeah, of course. Uh, skipping frames makes sense only to the extent uh, that uh, nothing serious has uh, changed in between. So it's more application to Yes? Uh, you said that in the beginning we want to be more random. Yes. And in the end more deterministic. Uh, well, I wouldn't call it necessarily deterministic. Yeah, okay. But how can we shift between uh, being random and more like, deterministic? So, like, even in practice or in theory? 
In theory, it goes like that. So uh, you're uh, you're having okay. Let's 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 write some code. <coughs> Let's call this epsilon. <coughs> so epsilon t is epsilon to the power of t. Uh, now we're uh, doing like a pseudo code would be like uh, uniform is like np random run. 0, 1, if u uh, larger than epsilon t, then uh, a t plus 1 is max output. Else, a d plus one is uh, run firm of possible actions. Something like that. I mean, it's not precise. <coughs> All right. Something like that. It's. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to work. Like. Precisely, yeah. but okay, <laughs> that's the idea. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you select the random actions to the way an optimal according to your network, because even the optimal is not really optimal. The probability is excellent. And in the beginning of training, our model is bad. So anyway, no one really trust it. Awesome, so. Uh, so that's alternatively U as the exploration versus exploitation dilemma. Who has heard of it before? Ooh. Nice. Very good. So early stages, we want strong exploration. And in the late stages, we want strong, strong exploitation. Sounds like human life. <laughs> right. So some examples of, uh, let's close with some examples of deep reinforcement learning, how it's used in practice. So here we see like in nature, the AlphaGo uh, case. Uh, deep reinforcement learning in Atari, uh, uh, overall Atari games, and here is the like, sort according to how well uh, uh, the algorithms do, the algorithms for it do, does in solving the game. Uh, in this line here, it's the human level or above. So you're actually having a model, an agent, which does better than humans. So most Atari games are now solved in a way, in a Computers do it better. Below, like asterisks or bubbles zone, etc. Uh, computers are still not as good. Specifically for AlphaGo, uh, um, the game of Go has uh, 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 48 possible game states. I can definitely tell you that the stars in the universe are much smaller, fewer, <laughs> or even the molecules. So even in, in a single game, the number of possible states is immense. It's like beyond number. In fact, it's actually an approximation of this number. It's not like that. <laughs> uh, uh, and as comparison, just has only 10 to the power of 120, which still is quite larger than the number of molecules or atoms in the universe. If I now, how do you actually even begin to solve this type of things? Like, how do you even begin to like, approach the problem? What most uh, uh, automatic algorithms do is that they use Monte Carlo research algorithms. I guess you've heard of Monte Carlo before. So uh, you start with random moves, and then you evaluate how often they lead to victory, and then you learn the value function to predict the quality. So uh, uh, I can plot 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 48 states of go. So I'm calling instead the few states of the tic tac <laughs> uh, So 
So uh, AlphaGo also relies on its research, uh, research procedure um, <coughs> and also relies on conlets to guide the research. So you've got Monte Carlo in the algorithm, but you still need a, a conlet to tell you how to go through the tree because the tree is huge. Uh, and um, a simple case of what they did was that they trained the conlet uh, to predict human moves. So not like learn by itself. But um, is it possible to predict human moves with a convolutional neural network? Uh, so um, they actually were able to do that with a 57% accuracy, which means that humans are quite predictable. Uh, they make intuitive moves instead of thinking too far ahead. It's not like I know that this particular move is going to be super good because in 10 steps from now I'm going to be in a better situation. It just feels wrong. Um, but in deep reinforcement learning, we don't care about predicting human right, moves because that's not, we can only then be as good as humans, not better. Creepy. Uh, so we want to learn the optimal moves, the uh, best possible optimal moves. Uh, so in the end, uh, what they did is they have two policy networks, one per side, one per opponent, and one value network, and then it has some sort of self-learning. So one plays against the other, one network plays against the other. And the value network there, the value function network, is trained on 30 million positions while the policy networks play. So the policy networks play against each other, and the value network tells you how far, uh, how good your, your um, uh, policies are. Uh, interestingly, both humans and RL agents play better in end game. So when things are kind of like settled, the dust is done, and then you just need to do precise movements, both humans and uh, machine learning models uh, perform better. So maybe there is a fundamental cause here. Um, and in the end, the best possible uh, model is the one that uses a combination of Monte Carlo simulation. So it explicitly enumerates all possible uh, actions, far ahead, like the, in the test, next 10 cases, next 10 Steps, time steps. So a combination of that and the value network out. This gives the best result. Yes? Uh, how do we know that humans and the reinforcement uh, learning play better and games? There is no comparative. No, it's not comparative. So the deep RL uh, uh, does better moves. You can evaluate the types of moves. How do you know? I'm not an alpha because I'm not a golden <laughs> player, no, but uh, there's a way to do it. Well, you can use the value network for that. If you have a really good value network, then that will tell you how good the board is. Yeah, this you can do with for, for the... Um, that's self referential. Essentially, what um, Fabrizio uh, asks is how, uh, 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 how can we evaluate that there are good moves, I suppose. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. I'm not like... Too, bad, too deep into Go, so I don't know exactly, but I trust the conclusion. They have a way to evaluate them. Because if you can see, if, if it was like humans are better in the early game and Go and Z for enforcement learning is better at the end game, I could understand, but how can we say if you're better at end games oh. than early games? That's a good question. You do not mean at early game. Maybe I will have to read it more. I think there are like some certain ways, in, like there is an elo for sure, but that's for ranking uh, players. Uh, I, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting question. I don't know yet. But anyway, what I will see here is that you need a combination of Monte Carlo simulation and uh, network prediction. Uh, why do we need that? Why not uh, only Monte Carlo simulation? New surgery. Who spoke? <laughs> <laughs> ah, right. Yeah, very, very correct. So, um, uh, you've got too much of uh, possibility. <coughs> so, in a way, we're now we're combining intuitive play. Uh, with thinking ahead. Thinking ahead comes from the Monte Carlo search. Well, it's not really thinking, but what is? Uh, but what, what, what <laughs> where is the catch? Can you take this algorithm and uh, just plug it? I mean, Go is one of the hardest games, right? Like, that's what this is what they say. Again, I'm not very deep into it, so I don't know. Maybe you can solve it if I play. I don't think so. But can you actually take this uh, algorithm, this method, as it is, and then put it into like, I don't know, playing soccer? 
They beat Jets last week. Sorry? They beat Jets last week. So if it generalizes a little bit, you need like a two person zero sum game. Yeah, so that's the alpha zero case, and there are already some, uh, compl not complaints, but like criticism. But yeah. all right, yes. Uh, that's for when you completely start from, from scratch. I agree. But like in general, can you chess falls in the same category. So what I'm saying is, can you take this algorithm and uh, use it to play soccer? I guess it only works with discrete uh, environments and not with the new ones. Exactly. So here is a highly discrete uh, environment. You've got certain things that you have to do, and that's it. Whereas if you have a robot playing football, you have to be able to stand, to walk, to score, to understand our tactics, and to collaborate with others, etc. What other else? Uh, okay, maybe it's like the context is not enough, but what could be another um, catch? Huh? Oh, that's another catch, definitely. But given that I haven't since I given, haven't given you the context, another catch is that uh, in the paper, they don't use pixels, they just use the actual space. If I remember correctly. So learning from pixels, like in the Atari case, of course, will be a bit harder. Maybe for, 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 uh, for, for Go, not, no, no, no. Well, anyways. Uh, this means that you cannot do it for, for soccer, right? You cannot uh, have, uh, like, uh, essentially, this would, would require having uh, like, uh, a GPS sensor from the game, uh, people to be able to uh, to apply this on software. Right? Would you choose users Yeah, this we can actually use. But then it's more uh, generalizable, right? Yes. Yes. So if you alter it to work with pixels instead of states or positions, then. Yes, but if you use pixels, then things become much more complex. Which uh, in real life you need that you need pixels you need like as raw measurements as possible, but then your learning becomes becomes much more complex. Essentially, here you've got the most discriminative information possible. You have the raw state information. That's like as as, as be, uh, the best you can have. Uh, Montezuma's Revenge. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Montezuma's Revenge is the hardest of the Atari games. It's the last one there. <coughs> so, and that's like a, a, a screenshot of the game. So can you tell me why, why is, that, is, it, is it that hard? Yes? I guess there would be really a lot of events happening. Like you have to get the rope to climb or go down. You can have different enemies. You have traps everywhere. So a lot of things to learn. Yes, a lot of uh, things to learn in terms of like a lot of possible, a lot of possibilities. <coughs> that's one thing. Another? Is that possible? Huh? Maybe that's possible. Yes, sort of. Planet. Huh? Yeah, planet. 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 Yeah. Planet. You also want to say something? Yeah, well, I think it's like the action is not the direct here. Yeah. yeah. The environment changes not only because of the action, right? They're, they're all very relevant, yes? <laughs> I think the rewards are extremely sparse here. Also, that, like, okay, these are all relevant. So, very long term dependencies. So, if, if, uh, some, uh, to win the level, sometimes you have to go to the next room, uh, go find the key, and then unlock the door somewhere here. So it's not just like I have to take one action and then one action or one action. It's, so there are very long-term dependencies. So uh, another one is uh, future rewards are too delayed. So the action solved. Something you need to plan very much ahead. So plan it. Which means it's hard to optimize. Uh, uh, and it takes a while to evaluate an action. Uh, a nice paper presented was, I think, uh, last uh, summer by Alexander Vesemitz. He presented uh, his work. Computable networks for her for reports learning, uh, showing uh, much better results in the game. He presented it here uh, in the division center. I don't know if you were there. Very nice uh, work. But anyways, the idea here is to have hierarchical, hierarchical split um, uh, search. Yeah. Can it also be the case that the score in that case is not helpful at all? 
Like if you have one with the lenses and you have to use a key to open the door, the score won't help you understand this. Because uh, they use the score as a reflex. Really right. Uh, what else can you have about score? I mean, opening a door might give you more reward. Right. But I think that means they only use the score as a reward. So it gives you more information. Uh, well, yes. In a way, what you're saying is that the assumptions that you're making by um, <coughs> by uh, picking uh, a certain way of uh, like a, a range of scores and stuff uh, is uh, suboptimal. Yes, that could be definitely the case. But there is also not an obvious way how to fix that because it is what it is. If you have maybe one planning, how are you going to get a better score? It's, it's definitely part of the problem, but I'm not sure if it's uh, the problem itself or a consequence of another problem which is more fundamental, like that you have very long-term dependencies. And StarCraft 2. Uh, I don't know how many of you know StarCraft, but I guess many. Uh, Oriol Vinyons uh, presented like, uh, uh, a few months before his uh, like grand initiative of, uh, of trying to solve he is indeed mine, he will be mine. So he presented uh, again in our seminars uh, <coughs> his initiative for bring StarCraft and DeepRL together. Uh, there is no great, I mean, there are a few papers in the by now, some nice papers, but uh, it's an open problem. It's maybe the next open problem for <coughs> mine, and maybe for you. So uh, uh, you've got a uh, machine learning API from Blizzard, and then a Python, I think, interface from DeepMind, and there's a paper also. If you can go to the link, then you can have more information if you're interested. What are the possible difficulties here? Yes? The early game seems packs a lot the late game, and that's super long reward for the next, because the game are long. So very long, but even longer than the term dependencies, yes. Other? You have to control also where the screen is. So it's not only getting what the screen is giving, but deciding where to look. Correct, correct. But also think in terms of what I said in the early, in the beginning of the lecture, about the environment, what can the environment be? Can it be observable or? Yeah. Huh? Information. Exactly. So in StarCraft, you have no access to everything, right? In Montezuma, or in similar Atari games, you can say that the whole frame contains the whole information. In StarCraft, you go to like only information of what's happening like in your terrain, like in a very limited part of your terrain, but nothing else. So you've got partially observable environment. Well, anyways, that's the end of the lecture and the end of the course in terms of lecture. We discussed today about reinforcement learning and true learning, also deep learning, and how to make it stable. Uh, we saw some examples, uh, real examples, how they use it. And uh, well, that's it. Thank you for your uh, attendance and uh, for.